Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. Two rounds have already been played in the Tata Steel Masters tournament. Sorry, I'm late to the party. I've been rather busy over the last couple of days. But I want to plunge straight into the highlight of round two, and that was the game between Magnus Carlsen and Anish Giri. Both these players drew in the first round. Let's see what happened. They're kind of best frenemies, if you like. Uh, there's a certain rivalry between them. So let's see. Carlsen with the white pieces, and he plays a Catalan. So... This, of course, was the opening that he played in his World Championship match uh, against Jan Nipponnishi. Uh, so is this a kind of World Championship preparation dividend? Um, let's see. Now, we had Queen C2 in that World Championship match. Um, if you remember, a very exciting game that went like this. And then Knight E5... Um, this was all very good stuff. Um, but let's go back. Now, instead of the normal move, queen c2, we have knight a3 from Carlsen. So that knight wants to take the pawn. If the knight can take the pawn, then white just has a very pleasant space advantage. Um, so in this variation, black is sort of forced to play bishop takes knight. So, uh, already we have a very unbalanced position on the board. Now, theoretically, this meant this position, this variation, is meant to be actually quite playable for black. Uh, black shouldn't have any difficulties. Um, but Carlson's got what he wants with white, and that's an unbalanced position. So he's obviously, you know, really wants to test Geary in this game. Now. What are the issues here? Well, as usual, the, the main issue in the Catalan is the difference between this bishop on g2 and the bishop on c8. The bishop on c8 can't get into the game very easily. You know, if you had two moves here and you could put that bishop on the long diagonal, then black would be fine. So if you could play b6 and bishop b7 here, but the problem is that after b6, the knights will come here. But that's the real issue in this position. The other issue is what happens with this pawn. Can black hang on to it? Um, does white have enough compensation in the form of the, the two bishops? Uh, let's see. So bishop d7. This is the normal move. So that bishop, as I said, wants to reach the long diagonal to block the bishop on g2. And here the normal move is knight e5 to swipe that bishop. And then bishop c6. So that bishop gets taken. So two bishops against two knights, but actually black is pretty well developed. So you can see, yeah, the, the queen side position has developed and there's a bit of pressure here. Basically, it's about equal, but black is fine. So that's the normal theoretical continuation. But here, Carlson played something different, a4. So this was, I can imagine, something that he must have looked at in his World Championship preparation. Um, and, and probably rejected it <laughs> as maybe being a bit too risky. I don't know. Anyway, he's wielded out in this game against Geary. So what's the point of a4? Well, it might be nice to put the pawn there. Uh, of course, it does make room for the bishop to, to reach a very nice diagonal here. Bishop c6 from Geary. That's the big idea. You put the bishop on c6 to blunt the bishop on g2 to match the bishop on g2. Bishop a3 attacks the rook. The rook steps to the side and now queen c2 attacks the pawn, connects the rooks. And if a move like bishop d5 to hang on to the pawn, then black has to contend with rook e1 and then e4. So instead of that, knight d7. So if queen takes pawn, then knight b6 will recover a pawn. So first of all, rook a c1. So this is interesting. So basically, Carlson wants to take here and keep that bishop kind of pinned down on the c file because there are obviously pressure on c7. And yeah, if knight b6 straight away, then that 
knight can be pushed away. So Geary waits, a6. Queen takes pawn. So now, like I said, we see the point of putting the rook on c1 before capturing. It means that bishop uh, can't move at the moment because of queen takes pawn. So let me see. Material is now even, uh, but after knight b6, then it's quite possible that this pawn is going to be snapped off as the knight and, uh, excuse me, as the knight attacks queen and pawn. So here is here it gets very delicate. If where's the queen go back to? If queen b3, then bishop takes, um, and that bishop sort of reaches quite a nice square. For example, here bishop b5. I think that was the point of a6 to potentially give that bishop some support here, and then for example c6 could be played just to block out that bishop. Um, let's go back. So that's the kind of thing that Carlson clearly wasn't too comfortable with and played queen c3, making sure that that bishop still can't take the a pawn because the queen takes c7. So knight takes a4 and queen b3. So a little delicate little shuffle from the queen. And that bishop is still kind of uh, tied to where it is because it's got to protect that knight. And this is a really critical moment in the game. So Geary is a pawn up. Carlson has sacrificed the pawn. But he's got a very nice bishop here. He's got a nice rook here. The queen is also active. So how does Geary kind of consolidate this position? What does he do next? Of course, you'd like to bring your queen into the game. To connect the rooks and we're going to see that's what happened in the second um, but it's not absolutely clear where, where the queen should go um, the threat is to play rook takes bishop and queen takes knight so what about just dropping the knight back well i suspect that geary was worried about rook takes bishop and then this starts to get very random i mean white has reasonable compensation just with rook c1. You could also play knight e5. Gets very, very complicated. I mean, objectively, black should not be worse there, but it's tricky. But Giri played queen d5. Well, that's kind of an attempt to solve all black's problems. You know, if black can exchange queens, <clears throat> then it should be okay. So, here is where Carlson had uh, dreamt up a very nice riposte to this. Rook takes bishop. Wow. So already getting very sharp. Really interesting. An exchange tax. So if pawn takes rook, then queen takes knight. So two minor pieces against a rook should be, well, probably just winning for white, actually. So therefore, queen takes rook, holds on to the knight and knight e5. So with that sacrifice, this bishop now has no opponent. This bishop slices across the board as well, and the knight on a very nice square on e5. But, well, black has an extra exchange and an extra pawn as well. So it's very interesting position. So exchange of queen should be okay for black. So therefore, queen c2. And that queen is potentially in the firing line. There's, there's rook b1 coming. Um, really interesting position. Um, and I think this is a very tough one to play for black. Here, Giri played knight d5. What about knight b6? This leads to a really uh, random position after bishop takes. And that's obviously critical because the rook is attacked. The bishop might come back here. And then knight c4. This is a very strange variation. Watch this. Now, black gives back the exchange. But this is so unclear now. Knight is very active. 
these pieces are kind of sort of stuck out <laughs> at the side of the board. Um, White's queen is active. Very strange position. I suspect not the kind of position that Geary really enjoys going into. I suspect he just doesn't trust that kind of position where it's sort of unstable, it's out of control. But maybe this position has gone too far. You can't control it. Um, he played knight d5. You know, I, I get the impression he's trying to shut things down, which is un very understandable. But after this, he's in trouble. The queen is attacked. Queen here, and Carlson plays in a very simple way. Bishop takes knight, gets rid of that knight. So pawn takes, and now rook takes b7. And black is still the exchange up, but under massive pressure. Absolutely massive pressure. That queen is actually in difficulties. Watch this. There's bishop b4, which, which traps the queen. All white's pieces looking good. Uh, rook on the seventh. Uh, queen can potentially come to the king side. This bishop on a superb diagonal. But yes, there are some interesting ideas. Bishop b4, of course, that's that's the one. So what should black play? Giri went for c5, but what about knight c3? Let's just have a quick look at this. This is an alternative. Bishop b4, white gets that piece back. There's a little little flurry with the queen, but actually huge advantage for white. Already, this is very, very difficult. So, Giri played c5. Wow. Uh, that gives the queen a square on d8, but just take a look at the seventh rank. And after queen f5, well, this already looks hopeless for black. It is hopeless. The attack here, uh, the queen and the knight are in Siberia, and this is where all the action is taking place now. On the king side, <clears throat> so rook f8 defends this, at least prevents the, the queen check. But knight takes f7, white's pieces are crashing through. Now there's a threat just to play, let's say, queen takes d5 or queen e6. So, for example, after check here, queen takes d5 with the standard threat of knight check, followed by queen g8 and knight f7 checkmate. So, queen d8, <coughs> excuse me. So, Giri wants to bring his queen back. It does at least prevent queen takes pawn. If knight takes queen, then rook takes queen. But of course, white doesn't need to take. Pawn takes pawn. So this is turning into a very powerful pass pawn now. And this knight is still shut out of play. Um, it's a pretty dreadful position. Queen f6. Giri offers an exchange of queens and Carlson goes for it. So if we look at the material balance, you can see that actually it's bishop and two pawns against a rook. So actually material is even now, but white has a dominating position with that rook on the seventh rank. The king is actually in a bit of trouble and this pawn is too strong. c6 opens that diagonal, rook c8 and c7. So you can see that rook can't be challenged. Um, these rooks are just stuck here. It's completely lost. Knight c3, bishop b2. But better be careful if, if, let's say, knight b5, then bishop f6 is checkmate. And if knight takes e2, then just king f1 again, mate threatened. So d4, knight check and knight d6. So that's attacking the rook there. And now if knight takes pawn and the knight comes back to c3, white is winning this very easily. Just exchange that off, bring the king up. The king will collect the pawn. 
These rooks can't do anything at all. They're completely stymied by white pieces. The king will collect the pawn and then just march up the board and will be able to support the c-pawn. Black is utterly lost. Giri played knight king g6. King f1. Okay, there's no need for anything flashed. The king protects the pawn. Knight takes rook. So white is no longer the exchange down and now just simplifies. Bishop takes pawn. And you can see that white is two pawns up with completely compact position. The knight dominate uh, the, the, the the knight is dominated by the bishop. The rook is active. It's just a, a simple technically winning endgame for Carlson and here Geary resigned. Well, absolutely crushing victory uh, for Magnus Carlson. Um, he said after the game. Uh, there was a fresh position where he had to, where Geary had to navigate some really difficult variations, and fortunately for me, he kind of went wrong. I had a clear initiative. It was very tough. Um, yeah, I think he he put some serious questions to Geary in the opening with with this idea of a four, um, and it's just a really tricky position. Uh, Carlson was asked whether this was his World Championship preparation, and he said, well, it was, it was sort of backup World Championship preparation. I suspect he might have gone for this maybe in one of the rapid games, if it had gone to the rapid games, but maybe just a bit too risky for a classical game. But he tried it here, and as a one-off, it worked incredibly well. So there we go. Um, beautiful game. Let's see where we're at. Uh, there, after two rounds, there are three players sharing the lead. Duda, Carlson, and Vidit, they're all on one and a half out of two. Uh, so no one with 100%. Um, and in round three, the pairings are, the big pairing is Duda with white against Carlson. And Dubov is playing against Vidit, so we'll see what happens there. I'll be giving you updates, of course, uh, with my video, my game of the day. So do, do tune into the channel, and I'll try to get those out as quickly as possible after the round. I'm doing my best, folks. Thanks for watching.